Hey, welcome to uh, my deck text of the decks that I played at the New Capanna Championship in both Historic and Standard. Um, that tournament, as many of you probably know, went way over my expectations. Um, but I'm still going to, planning to do a um, review of all the non-feature matches that I played. So keep an eye out for those in the coming weeks. Uh, for now, I'm gonna uh, just go over the decks I played, starting with Humans in Historic. Um, it was kind of not the deck I expected to play, because go after the Kamigawa Championship, our team had such a good record with the Green Black Food deck, despite many of us not even like playing the deck super well, uh, or being too familiar with it. So we felt that like, we could probably do even better, and also that tournament had like a lot of control decks, um, which we expected to be not quite as popular for the new Capella Championship. So everything lined up in a way where it seemed smart to just lock in food a couple months in advance and just practice it and get even better with it. Um, turns out that I actually did not spend that much time practicing food. And when the new Capella Championship like rolled up and we had to start the testing period, uh, some of my teammates were also looking into humans, which is a deck that I uh, actually suggested um, right after the tournament of uh, the of the, the Neon Dynasty Championship, the last one, uh, saying that humans actually seemed like it would have been a great choice for that meta game, which was filled with control and Phoenix, but not much food. Um, and we actually expected that the meta game would be somewhat similar. We did know that there would be more food and there would be less control, but we kind of expected them to be about the same amount of play, because. The good thing about humans is that it is an Esper Sentinel Thalia deck. Um, even Ranger Captain of Eos also like punishing non-creature spells. There's a lot of things that like, really punish non-creature spells um, in this deck. And humans also takes advantage of the format being centered around non-creature decks. Like Phoenix, obviously Phoenix has creatures, but it is like mostly a non-creature deck uh, in that um, it is based around non-creature spells, right? Um, so, and stuff like Control, and you would have like certain combo decks and so on. Um, like the Arcanist deck, and the Auras and the Affinity deck. Like all of these are, you know, like a lot of these have creatures, but they also have a ton of non-creature spells. So they really get hurt by stuff like Sentinel and Thalia. Even the food deck has a ton of non-creature spells, right? Like these cards are just very good in the metagame. But it also means that since there aren't actually any like aggro tribal type uh, deck in the format, people are just cutting um, their sideboard hate. Stuff like Anger of the Guards and Witches of Engines, they just like, don't see play in, in the format anymore. And so like that's a really sweet spot for humans. Except last time it was driven out by the green-black food matchup, which is the worst matchup among the popular decks. And the food deck can single-handedly keep humans uh, on the down low, at least if it's popular enough. But we didn't expect food to be that popular. Um, turns out we were wrong. Uh, in a way, because the control decks were only like 15 players and there were 40 food players. Uh, so that was, that was not great. But yeah, I think the human deck is pretty good against Phoenix, very good against control, um, quite good against Arcanist. I think also like pretty favored against Auras, depending on the build, uh, but not good against food. So like we actually have a ton of like pretty good matchups. It's like 50-50 versus Affinity. Um, have a ton of pretty good matchups and we've been like, you know, working on this deck and trying to tune it. The big thing that humans got since last time is Inquisitor Captain, which is just another collective company, essentially. So the fact that you have this like potential for aggressive starts that are somewhat disruptive, it's not like humans are super fast, but it gives up a bit of its speed in order to be able to interact with the opponent. Um, but the fact that you can do this on top of having just these like really powerful, um, you could say card advantage engines, but at least like board impact cards, that um, that really just like yes, swing the board in your favor a lot of the time is uh, quite incredible. This deck has a lot of staying power. Like it's really hard to keep it down with spot removal because of both Inquisitor Captain and Collector Company in here. And um, and we've already seen like Inquisitor Captain like do work in alchemy, but yeah, it's definitely also like fits right into this deck. Like the human thing is very much interested in just a three three vigilance human. Um, so the body of Inquisitor Captain itself is, is definitely relevant. Uh, Vigilance is also pretty good against stuff like Emperor, for instance, or like when you're trying to race in certain matchups. Um, 
So, like, uh, why did we end up on, on this exact spit of cards? Um, there's a lot of, like, cards that are should be locked in the deck, like Thalia, Thalia's a tenant, the Ranger Captain, and the Esper Sentinel. And, and these four drops are definitely in there. Adeline has to be a three of or four of in this deck. The card is incredibly, uh, incredibly good with um, Thalia's a tenant. And... Um, and then you probably want some sort of interaction like Skyclaves or Brutal Cathar. And Brutal Cathar is a better choice if you have like a lot of auras and other humans deck. But since we um, did expect that there were a lot of decks like the Phoenix deck that have a bunch of shocks. So like you can't really kill their Ledger Shredders with uh, Brutal Cathar very reliably because they will just kill your Brutal Cathar, right? But Skyclave is a lot better in that matchup. Um, a lot better against um, a lot better against food as well and so on. Um, so, even though it's not a human, it doesn't actually matter that much because, at least in the traditional version of the deck, it's only Thalys and Tenant that actually care about the human tribe. Um, the rest of the cards are just like, wide aggressive cards, where it doesn't really matter if the humans are not. We did add Katilda to the deck, which is a new addition. Um, we have seen some of the, like, other cards from Midnight Hunt, such as Brutal Gathar and the, um, uh, and, and, and the guy with Ward that like gets bigger for every human you have. Uh, the, the three mana green guy. I forget the name. Um, but we decided that like that was actually not a three drop we were interested in. But Katilda had overformed a lot um, in this slot. We were quite surprised with how good it actually was. So sometimes you just go like Esper Sentinel into Katilda into like another one drop that's like you know one of your nut draws. Sometimes you just go Katilda on turn two. And if they don't have removal spell, you just start casting your Inquisitor Captains and Companies on turn 3 already. But most of the time, the way it would work is that you would go stuff like Sentinel into Thalia, and then on turn 3, you play Katilda, and then you tap these creatures to play like a Ranger Captain as well. So, so that in a sense, Katilda would just be a free card, because it immediately costs 2 mana, but your creatures also produce that mana to make up for it. And you just like explode onto the board that way. Where even if they kill Katilda, you're not actually down mana in that exchange. And if they don't kill Katilda, well, the ability here to put a counter on every creature matters a ton. Especially since you have a lot of vigilance creatures like Adeline and Inquisitor Captain, uh, where you can attack with them and then still activate, use them to activate Katilda. So, in that sense, like, Katilda is a pretty big threat, but. Also, it's it's you can often set up spots where um, where it doesn't cost you that much mana wise to develop it onto the board, where you can really punish the opponent when they can't kill it. So big fans of Katilda. It's not that good against Phoenix necessarily in the post board games because you have like a lot of other cards you want to bring in that are non human like Crawl Harpooners and Graveyard Aid. I, I still think it's fine in game one. I think it's very good against food as your game plan in that matchup is just to try and develop to the board um, as quickly as you can and pressure them and then like finish the game by using Ranger Captain to keep them off of Meat Hook. And Katilda really helps with this game plan where you can develop onto the board and then start keeping things out of Meat Hook range by activating the 6 mana ability. Um, and against stuff like Auras that don't really interact with your creatures, Katilda is just nuts. It really lets you like develop the board while you can like interact with them and keep them off the off balance. Um, another choice you have to make with this deck is like which one drops to play with Ranger Captain um, to go fetch. I think Giant Killer is like the the lock, the one you definitely have to play. Um, and then like there, there's a couple different options. We ended up going with like a pretty modest showing of one Dawnless Bodyguard, one Thrabman Inspector. Generally, like there's a lot of options of like different one mana cards you could fetch. And when you have a tutor in your deck, I think it's pretty important to consider not to put too many one-offs in your deck. Because um, otherwise you will have draws where you just draw a bunch of random one-offs that don't actually work out. So you have to limit yourself. And especially if you can do it with cards that are fine to draw, um, that's even better. So, from Inspector, I think it's kind of a lock. It's just like sometimes you don't want to get Esper Sentinel in the very late game when the opponent has a lot of mana. So just being able to cycle your Ranger Captains just matters a lot. But you do board out with Thrab Inspector quite often, so it's not, you know, that necessary. But against stuff like Arcanist, for instance, it can be really, really important that you have an Inspector. Against Control as well. Um, the Dauntless Bodyguard can just sometimes be relevant to get. It doesn't come up that often, but sometimes you really want to, like, protect an Adeline against the Phoenix deck, um, or protect your Thalia, or whatnot. So, 
like maybe you're against control and they have a potential for a wrath of god coming up so the bodyguard can also like help protect you there without having to like sacrifice the range of captain in case they don't have the wrath of god um you could also run Inchblade Companion, which is one of the new cards that's like a, a one mana um, reconfigure creature that like keeps copying itself. Um, that one is pretty good actually. You could run one copy in the sideboard or even main. It's just the card is very, very good against Control and Arcanist, but not against the other decks in the format. So we ended up moving it from the main deck to the sideboard and eventually cut it from the sideboard as we figured the Control and Arcanist matchup were good enough that you don't actually need the extra cards. Um, speaking of the sideboard, it's pretty straightforward. The big thing that we innovated was Crawl Harpooner to deal with Phoenix, especially when they have Ledger Shredder uh, and also Symmetry Sage in some cases. Like when they play turn 2 Ledger Shredder and you just follow that up with a Crawl Harpooner and you just get to eat their creature while still having a threat, that is incredible. It's also a removal spell for stuff like Storming Entity or uh, like a Dragon Rage Channeler that is a creature. So like obviously you could play stuff like Decoration in Stone instead, which might be more reliable as a removal spell. But that's not really the point. Um, because you're running Inquisitor Captain and Collector Company, having something that is a cheap creature is so much more valuable than having something that isn't a cheap creature. So every sideboard slot that is not a, a, a creature is something you really have to like think hard about or consider if that's actually worth putting in your deck. So Stuff like the Thomas Crypt and the Portable Holes, um, they earned their spot in the sideboard because they solve very specific issues that creatures can't really do. But in this case, it's stuff like uh, killing Hushbringer out of the Auras deck, uh, and obviously like being you know graveyard hate against Phoenix that comes down efficiently enough. Uh, I will note that we have uh, an Elspeth Resplendent here from the new set. Um, the reason we added this is uh, we tried to figure out how to like shore up the food matchup. We tried a bunch of things like voting in Outland Liberators and like crawl up opponents to kill the goose and have like a ton of uh, like Red Dane and so on to keep the meat hooks at bay. And we had a lot of different cards that we were trying out. And in the end, we figured out that the best strategy is actually to like barely sideboard. Because your best plan, as I said, is to just jam onto the board and then hold them at bay with Ranger Captain of Eos. Uh, so, uh, actually you don't really want to sideboard that much because your deck is already designed to do that. It just sucks that like the matchup is already pretty bad, like 40% probably. Um, we did end up going 50-50 against food in the tournament, so maybe it's better than we could give it credit for. But yeah, sometimes, you know, you have a matchup that's really bad and you only make it worse if you try to beat it. Which is a pretty like, bad feeling, but you know, that's how it is. Uh, but the Elspeth... Um, or Garruk um, is also something we tried, the one that can give plus three, plus three and trample. Basically, a Planeswalker, which is a card type that food has an, a hard time interacting with, doesn't die to meat hook, that can make your creatures um, get through the cat's oven lock. Because, like, you can make a really big Adeline or Lieutenant, but it just keeps getting blocked by the, the cat. And what Elspeth does is that, well, it, it starts to give your creatures flying, which is like, pretty... Uh, pretty good. It can also like find you a Skyclave Apparition with the minus three, which can definitely matter in some cases. Or find you a Lieutenant, find your Ranger Captain, in case you need to log it off against the Meat Hook. So, I think it has enough utility, but since it is a five mana card, um, and you already have a lot of non-creature spells, and maybe you have a Thalia in play, so it gets even more expensive, we decided to like not run too many copies of this. The only change I would make to this deck right now is minus one planes, plus one Shafet Dunes. Maybe even two Shafet Dunes but the damage can uh, be a problematic. Because I, I think you, can, you can't afford to get that just a little bit extra out of your lands. Though the deck is like, already has a lot of utility in its lands, and it doesn't really flood that often because of the, the, the power of Inquisitor Captain and Collective Company, and Ranger Captain and so on. There's, and I can tell that there's a lot to spend your mana on, actually. So anyway, that's the human deck. Um, And let's uh, let's go move on to Esper here. So for standard, there was not as much deck building to be done, because um, Esper was already one of the known decks. The main thing we figured out, um, and I was not even one of the people working on the Esper deck. Uh, there was a lot of uh, Sakini's um, effort actually. But what he figured out is that usually the um, the Esper decks were wanting to rest and like other discard spells in the sideboard. 
but that's duress is like for a different type of mid-range deck that is for the the john style you know i just want to trade 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 with everything you've got and we are both in top deck mode and my top decks are going to be better that is not the game plan for esper because esper has stuff like rafine and luminog aspirant and even like the wandering emperor like these cards that can um enhance your creatures and start a snowball effect like wedding announcement too in that way that are way better when you're like develop it early and then just like let them buy it by themselves if you play these early they will very quickly snowball an advantage where you get an overwhelming board state the only thing you need to do is to then make sure that your opponent um doesn't get enough out of their place to like come back in the game and so that's why uh counter spells like the gate and disdainful stroke are way better than the rest in this type of strategy because you really just want to play something and then keep up your interaction, try and trip up the opponent. Uh, the Tenacious Underdogs are kind of interesting. We were trying a bunch of different numbers because we realized they were quite good, but not that good in multiples, um, since you usually don't have the ability to blitz multiple of them. Uh, and so we tried a bunch of like other different two drops, some stuff that were good against runes with Death Touch, some, uh, like this, some other things with like Disturb and so on. But in the end, we decided that Underdog was actually just the best option. It, it does hit very hard. And in the mirrors, it's very important to have access to an Underdog because the games can go quite long. And there's full Vanishing Verse in the mirror. So the first Underdog will usually get hit by Vanishing Verse. And that's why it's pretty important to have a second one. On top of that, in the mirror, we're planning to board out Luminog Aspirant because uh, people bring in Rare of Enfeeblement. And we wanted to make that card worse. And also, Luminog Aspirant is just not that great of a top deck. It just... It's not as impactful as you really want it to be. Um, so if we're boarding out a Luminog Aspirant, but we still want some number of two drops to make Rafine and Kaido better, uh, we decided that, yeah, we should just have four underdogs in our deck. And that that is going to be our two drop uh, in the mirror, alongside Bankbuster, which I only paid one copy of, but I'll quickly uh, go over the changes I would make to the deck in a moment. Um, so... Yeah, we tried to, uh, you know, be a little bit tempo-based with stuff like Spell Pierce as well as another, um, as another way to play into this fish game plan. We do have some number of Planeswalkers, but they're very limited outside of the Wandering Emperor because they are important in the mid-range matchups, but not really anywhere else. I mean, Kaido definitely plays into this fish game plan, but stuff like Sorin and Loth, less so. Um, so, we're trying to, like, limit ourselves a bit there. And then you see us play three Infernal Grass, which is quite a lot. But the thing is that Banishing Verse being so popular in the format means that people are going to try and pick their threats to get around it. People are playing stuff like Hinata and Evelyn and whatnot, uh, which are both cards we did not really expect. But we definitely expected that people would bring something that Banishing Verse does not hit. And having Infernal Grass is just the best answer to all these things. Um... The standard format is very like snowboardy, it's very play draw based, but it's not actually that much about the, 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 the like, small points of damage, because usually a person winning wins by a large amount. So the two damage you take off Infernal Rasp doesn't actually matter that much compared to um, the cost of playing other cards that maybe don't hit exactly what you need to hit uh, at the right time, such as um, Power Word Kill not hitting Gold Span Dragon, for instance, or other cards being just more expensive. Um, as for the sideboard, there's not really much else to say. You definitely want your Archons to beat the uh, the Jeskai Dragonstorm deck um, and and the the runes. And yeah, basically the deck is just like you know, just a very powerful deck. Um, that can like, definitely has some free wins when you curve Luminarch into Rafine at times, and it's you know it's very nice to play a deck in standard that has free wins. There's a lot of them in, in the format right now. But yeah, the trick is to figure out like how do you actually win on the draw in especially the mid-range mirrors, which can be very play draw dependent because of stuff like Ravine and winning announcement. Um, and yeah, the way you do that is to try and not play anything turn two, try and be reactive. If you can pass with the gate and ray of enfeeblement up in the mirror on turn two, then uh, then you can like answer their three drop with your two mana, and then like maybe that can like help you. Uh, claw back into take take the the, the offensive position. Um, I would make some changes to the deck that I'll just show very quickly, and these will be in my sideboard guide that I will post in the description here. 
but um, the main thing is that I wanted to cut a Sorin for Kaido, because Kaido just being cheaper, I think matters more, and um, and it's also, Kaido was like better on the draw in a mid-range matchups than I anticipated. Um, so I, th I think I would have wished to just have a second copy of this. I think it's just better in more spots than Sorin is, um, partially because it's cheaper. It's really nice to have these like 10 free drops that you just like can slam on turn 3. The other thing is to cut a uh, Hive for a Hakra Mauling. I think Hakra Mauling is really nice to complement the Infernal Grasp. People aren't playing basics right now, so it's often just a murder, but also a land. And having more lands than our spells to pitch to Rafine's Connive actually matters quite a bit. Um, and it, the last thing is to cut the Liesa from the sideboard for a second Bankbuster. Uh, Liesa was partly for the Runes matchup, but we have enough sideboard cards for that matchup anyway, so you kind of overboard it. Whereas the Bankbuster can be quite important in the mirror, again, to play something turn two. Uh, especially on the play, even though you bought out your Luminarchs. And then I'm just have, I just have three strokes to negate instead of the reverse number because of both Dragonstorm being popular and doing well, and then Hinata also popping up, where just aim for stroke is better than negate. Um, so yeah, those are uh, the small changes I would make, and there is a sideboard guide linked. Thank you for watching, and I hope you'll look forward to me going over my matches and see how they play out. Bye.